This is off planet radio. Hey guys, it's Emily from Off Planet Radio, and you are just about to watch um, a show I recorded the other night with uh, Randy and Jennifer Constantine, where we kind of do a little deeper into some of the stuff behind uh, the USA Gymnastics Larry Nassar scandal and uh, see what lies beneath it. Um, I did make an, one error, and I wanted to correct that. At some point in the show, you'll talk, hear me talk about how I'm disturbed about the fact that there haven't been more uh, Karoli gymnasts or Woga gymnasts that have uh, spoken out about this. And I want to correct a mistake. I said that Caitlin Ohashi had been involved just in a little video that had been made for the UCLA meet. But actually, I did some looking last night, and she has been speaking out in the last several weeks very aggressively. Caitlin Ohashi was a former uh, junior national team member, um, and then she kind of disappeared for a while before going to college. Um, she is not claiming to have been raped or abused, but she is speaking out in support of the girls who've come forward quite quite aggressively. She's actually um, made and performed uh, some poetry about it. And I also found out that several months back, she'd also spoken out about how she had been psychologically abused by her coach, um, Valerie Luke, and, and body shamed for her weight and whatnot. And so I just wanted to be clear. And that also Natalie Brown, who's on the Oklahoma gymnastics team, I believe she was a Woga gymnast and she's been very supportive of um, the girls who've come out with their stories as well. So just trying to get as much of this as accurate as possible. If I have made some other mistakes in there, I apologize. I'm trying to do my, the best I can with this. Um, anyway, uh, this show is a little harder for me to get through than the one I did with Robert. Um, so I apologize for any um, stuttering and pauses and uh, just general, um, I don't know, a little bit difficult for me to get through this one, guys. But uh, thank you to Randy and Jenny for doing it with me, and see you on the other side. Thanks, guys. I think where we're going to go on this show tonight kind of goes to the edge of a lot of things that need to be talked about. Um, our guest and my co-host, Emily Moyer, who will be up in a minute, um, feel very strongly that what has been going on in the media drama surrounding the U.S. gymnastics team and obviously the recent court decision that pronounced a 147-year sentence on one of the perpetrators has ignited another firestorm of controversy. There's much more behind the scenes than we have to bear in mind that what we're talking about here is a very specific area of a much wider inquiry that goes not only just into pedophilia, uh, the predatoring of, of small children, but also the entire culture of mind control and um, traumatic assaults to the, to the psyche and minds of, of children in certain types of programs as well as in the kind of programs that we take our own children into. And with all of this, there comes the element of responsibility that we all have to deal. People who step forward have already taken responsibility. We have to take the responsibility for hearing their story and bearing witness to it and then doing something about it. And so in a sense, tonight's show is kind of an outreach to the people who have been the victims and the people who have been the enablers, however passive they have performed that. So it's a serious topic, and it's one that I think the two ladies that are with me for this show are more than qualified to speak to from background, experience, research, and their presence in the media. Emily, go ahead and bring our guest in, and let's let's go into this. First of all, Brandy, that was a actually a really good uh, introduction. I really liked that. Um, hi, guys. Uh, welcome back to another uh, Off Planet Radio. I'm glad to be back. Uh, I had a little vacation, and then um, I had a, an interview with Robert. Um, last week that I'm hoping that uh, you guys... Robert Phoenix, that would Robert be. Robert Phoenix, yes. yes. Um, Which is up on our YouTube channel. Up on our YouTube channel. If you haven't seen that yet, maybe I suggest you go listen to that before um, this because I'm treating that as a sort of like a part one in this like a deep, deeper dive. And I really want to thank Robert for, for doing that with me. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, 
we're going to dive deeper into some aspects of what I talked about there tonight. And um, here to do that with me is uh, a good friend of the show and uh, Randy's occasional sparring partner. And um, she and I have been trying to get this done for a long time now. Uh, we, we, recorded, we, we recorded a show about eight weeks ago before all this really broke super big in the media. I mean, you know, right after kind of Allie Raisman had made her statement and whatnot, but before the court thing. And we had brought up some things that we're gonna discuss tonight, just kind of like on a surface level. Um, and, you know, we somehow the recording was lost, which has not happened to me before, even though I saw it recording the whole time. So I don't know if it was taken because we were trying to get out ahead of something or if it was just, you know, whatever, bad luck. Whatever it is, um, she and I have been working on this for a long time and been wanting to get to this. And so, um, with no further ado, finally, for the first time on Off Planet Radio, please welcome Jennifer Constantine. Oh, man. Thank you guys so much for having me. This is definitely um, a long time coming. Um, yeah, it is, actually. Welcome. It is. You know, the three of us haven't, you know, really gone in on something uh, together. Um, so, thank you, for, thank you for having me. I think we're going to get some great stuff done tonight. And I just want to um, let people know part of the reason I selected uh, Jenny to talk about this with us is um, Jenny is about the same age as a lot of these girls who have spoken out and she has children and she is an avid researcher and advocate, uh, an avid researcher into pedophilia and uh, human trafficking, sex trafficking and um, social engineering. And she's a very strong advocate for the people who suffer from these and uh, against the media that likes to spin it um, the way that they do. And she speaks out in, with an aggression and a passion that I don't see in too many young people. And um, I saw her sharing information about the gymnastics scandal um, just completely separate from me. And um, she's not a gymnast and she doesn't know necessarily that much about the technical aspects of it, but I know she appreciates it and watches it and whatever. And um, I just thought her perspective would be really good. And so, you know, before we kind of get into uh, where we're going tonight, I just want to ask you, Jenny, when this all started to come out, what did you think? What did you see? What does this look like to you? Well, I have to tell you that my first, uh, my, my knee jerk reaction with this was that I was skeptical. Um, skeptical of the way that it was coming out, skeptical of the, um, the outlets that were presenting it at all. Um, but that's just, you know, something I have to keep into check um, and check myself and say, why is this coming up for me? Why am I skeptical? Certainly not skeptical of any of the testimony coming out, not doubting these women in any way, shape or form. We know that this happens. We know that this is, you know, uh, a problem. However, um, given the timing of it, um, along, you know, running parallel to what we are seeing in Hollywood with all of the pedophilia coming out, I just have to question, you know, all of these things that, you know, what is really going on here? Um, but then as we moved further through this, I started to realize that there was a, a definite possibility that the cards really were crumbling now and that this was authentically happening. This really was happening. Um, I think that there's still this really thick, disgusting veil um, being held over this. I mean, when I see people like Megan Kelly mm -hmm. um, hosting, uh, you know, her show and having the gold medalists on her show talking about their testimony. I mean, I know that they're telling the truth, but I know Megan Kelly to be a filthy lying, you know, go for it. Say whatever you want to say. <laughs> so, you know, and so I just, I think that even though these women are coming out and they are being extremely brave and telling their story, they're still being manipulated. Mm -hmm. they're, they're still being um, directed in the, the narrative is still being controlled. So that's really what I want to like dig to get to the bottom of is, is not just what CNN, you know, cause it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah. and you do have to dig to get to the bottom of it because the, each public outing is really masking a much bigger layer to all of this. Um, you know, we're not talking ancient history when we're talking about what happened with um, Harvey Weinstein and then Kevin Spacey in pretty rapid succession on the heels of a previous year when you saw Pizzagate erupt with mm -hmm. Pizzagate itself having a lot of false clues, rabbit trails, 
and disinfo that you had to peel off in order to get to a few hardcore truths about the people that were actually being outed in that. Again, smoke screens for another layer up the food chain, if I can use that term. So a lot of what we're doing, we're, we're seeing the unraveling of a system, the tip of the iceberg. And this is, you know, this is rapidly accelerating now because it's like the night of the long knives, I guess, during the, the, the Nazi thing when they basically turn on each other and they don't have a choice because they're all blackmailed. So that's kind of what we're seeing right now in terms of how the media has to deal with this. And the media is masking a lot of it because they're complicit right up to their eyeballs. Yeah. So, okay. So um, I definitely, I'm glad you brought up some of the stuff with the pizza gate and we're going to get into that a little bit later on. Um, I've been kind of struggling how I wanted to kind of go into all the things I want to go into. It's a lot easier when I had Robert interviewing me to talk about it than it is me trying to kind of construct the show about it. So if I jump around a little bit, please forgive me guys. This is a difficult topic for me. Um, but I think what we're going to do, because it helps to provide some context for some of the things we're going to talk about, is we're going to play, I'm going to play some clips. I don't know if I'm going to play them all. Like, I'm going to play them one at a time and maybe we'll chat about them after each clip. Um, they're a little bit lengthy of clips, but there's, I think what you guys will see if you listen and pay attention is there's data points in there that can help us to navigate where we want to go next. And so um, I'm going to do that now. I'm going to start with... Um, a clip from this is um, this is Maddie Larson uh, testifying at the hearing for the sentencing a few weeks ago. Maddie Larson is a was a former national team member and a gymnast on the UCLA gymnastics team for a couple of years. T absolutely gorgeous gymnast who kind of disappeared. She was on the UCLA team for a couple of years and then sort of disappeared and. Everyone wondered what happened to her, or I did certainly, and you, you kind of always had the feeling like maybe something was wrong, but you didn't know what, and um, over the last few weeks and months, we found out what was going on from her, and um, I thought her testimony was really powerful and actually provided in some ways the most amount of data points for us to work with. Um, just so you know, as many of the gymnasts that I speak about tonight, um, because we're talking about something that is really, really difficult, and I want you to also understand who they really are, um, in the show notes, I will include uh, video clips that I select of them at what I think were their finest moments in gymnastics. So you can kind of see uh, the amazing people we're talking about, uh, you know, and because th th this is both part of them, the person who is in the courtroom and the person who is a gymnast. So I'm going to include those in the show notes. But this is Maddie Larson from her testimony in the sentencing hearing for Larry Nasser. Here we go. I just couldn't comprehend that someone like him could do something so awful. On top of that, who was I going to tell? Certainly not my coaches, who I was afraid of. I also didn't tell my fellow teammates because the times he treated me at the ranch, besides when we were traveling and would get treatments in his room, it appeared it happened to be in the same room as all of them. A lounge where we would watch TV on a big couch and the treatment tables were behind it. I figured if, his, if he is doing this in front of my friends, it can't be that bad, right? Even the other trainer, Debbie Van Horn, who still now works for USA Gymnastics, would be in the room many of the times Larry abused me. If a trainer, a professional trainer, doesn't say anything about it, I should trust her. At least that's what I thought. In the midst of all these adults who I was scared of, Larry, you were the only one I trusted. In the end, you turned out to be the scariest monster of all. There's an eerie feeling as soon as you step foot onto the Caroli Ranch. It is completely removed from all civilization. In the case of an emergency, the closest hospital is so far away, you need to be helicoptered there. To get to the ranch, you must drive up a dirt road for what seems like an eternity. And the closest civilization is a high security prison 30 miles away. On top of that, there is no cell service. It's completely isolated. And that's no mistake. That is how the Corollis wanted it. We lived off the snacks that we had to sneak in our luggage. I eventually spiraled into a very intense and destructive eating disorder for six years. I took anywhere from five to 15 laxatives without missing a single day for those six years. Thinking that was the only way to stay skinny enough and therefore be liked by my coaches and the national team staff. Depending on the day, 
I would have six or seven hour practices six days a week, hopefully getting a break if I was doing well enough that day. And I wouldn't eat all day until practice was over. I would even have days where I'd go a whole practice without taking a sip of water until it was over, and then gorge myself when I got home. Almost every day I felt like I would faint after each routine. I honestly don't know how I managed not to. Around the age of 15 or 16, I would start getting panic attacks before leaving to go to the ranch. One time, I was so desperate not to go, I thought faking an injury bad enough was the only way out. I was taking a bath when I decided to push the bath mat aside, splash water on the tiles, get on the floor, and bang the back of my head against the tub hard enough to get a bump, so it seemed like I slipped. My parents immediately took me to the hospital because they thought I had a concussion. I was willing to physically hurt myself to get out of the abuse that I received at the ranch. When I attended the next camp, Marta Caroli approached me and said, you know what? Kim's muscle fell out of the top bunk in the cabins here and she didn't miss practice the next day. She did not say another word to me for the rest of the camp. It makes me so sad to think about how desperate I was at that time. Feel like as if that was the only way I could ensure not having to go to camp. <laughs> 2010 World Championships was an extremely low point for me. I made two major errors in my floor routine, which cost us the gold medal. I was immediately shunned by my coaches, Marta, and some of the other staff that traveled with us. I could see the fear in my teammate Rebecca Bross's face who was up next because I'm sure she was thinking that if she messed up as well, she'd be in even more trouble than I was about to be in. I wasn't even allowed to give my parents a hug until I flew back home over a week later. My fellow teammates on the trip who were Rebecca, Allie Raisman, Chelsea Davis, Alicia Sacramoni, Mackenzie Coquato, and Bridget Sloan did what they could to lift my spirits, telling me it was going to be okay. But that was not the case for many of the adults there. I had never felt so small and disposable in my life. I spiraled into a deep depression. It truly bothers me that one of the adults who treated me this way, making me feel completely invisible, is a new national team coordinator, Valeri Lukin. It troubles me that he is now in that position and I hope for the sake of the current and future national team members, he has changed. The complete detachment from the outside world on top of careless and neglectful adults made the ranch the perfect environment for abusers and molesters to thrive. But thanks to the women who have spoken here, that horrible place has been closed. However, I am hoping that another critical, state, critical step will be made as well. Last March, I traveled to Washington, D.C. and met with Senator Dianne Feinstein to tell her my story, along with some of my fellow survivors. I then attended the hearing by the Senate Judiciary Committee, which led to the introduction of legislation to require Olympic governing bodies, including USAG, to immediately report sex abuse allegations to local or federal law enforcement agencies. I was shocked to learn that this law did not already exist. It has passed the Senate, but hasn't even come up for a vote in the House of Representatives yet. Today, I ask Speaker Paul Ryan to schedule this for a vote immediately. It's not only about switching to a better location. We must ensure that legal steps are made to prevent anything of this nature and magnitude from happening again. I recently learned that Michigan State received repeated reports beginning in 1998 from numerous girls and women alleging Larry sexually assaulted them. If the right thing was done then, 20 years ago, I should have never met this sad excuse for a man. I was extremely disappointed to find out about this news. I've also learned that from 2014 to, to 2016, Larry was under criminal investigation for molesting young girls and women. President Simon, you didn't call, you didn't notify USAG you and Michigan State let him go to the ranch and attend international competitions. There he molested my friends and my teammates. How could you? 
What's wrong with you? Have you no decency, ma'am? Marta, did you keep Larry around because he was a good doctor? Or did you really keep him around because he let us compete when we were injured and was willing to keep your secrets? Larry, I trusted you. I believed you were a kind person. I believed you were on my side. I thought you cared about me and my well-being. We would joke around and you'd even listen when I'd tell you how mean my coaches and Marta was. I truly thought you understood. You took complete advantage of my innocence. Your kindness was simply a ploy to molest me every chance you got. I can't even put into words how much I fucking hate you. Your Honor, I stand behind my former teammates and survivors who have asked you to give Larry the maximum possible sentence. No accolade or award is worth enduring abuse. There is another way, a healthy and supportive way to make champions. Thank you. That was Maddie Larson, and um, I took notes during that, um, took notes while we listened to that of things that came up for me that I wanted to talk about, but I just want to kind of hear your guys' response to that testimony, just kind of a general one, and then we'll get into these different points that I've taken. Well, this is, I think the first thing that popped out to me, apart from the fact that it was heart-wrenching testimony, I mean, listening to her describe how she was internalizing this, this trauma that she was dealing with systematically. It's just heart-wrenching to hear any survivor's testimony. Um, but then, you know, okay, so she came forward, you know, it, it came out, and they fly her to D.C. to talk to Diane Feinstein. Right, yeah. Right. She, she's the, the loving, supporting arms that she's thrown into to talk about her story. I mean, it's just more. It's just more. They, they just yeah. sort of, you know, pass them around, and still we see this. They're just being manipulated even further all of that needs to be torn away I, I, yeah. be well those are actually classic sig classic signatures of a lot of things it's kind of military mm -hmm. it's also kind of mk ultra ish in a way yeah because it's installing fear generally in, in a program there's a balance between the advocate and the um antagonist mm -hmm. or what's called men or proctor system so somewhere in there there are figures that are installing the fear programs that basically keep them entrained into the program just to, to, to stimulate performance to create the fragment alters that are the performers that disassociate pain mm -hmm. that are capable of handling a fair amount of rigor in training, constant pushing. Yeah. These are not things that are natural to children. I mean, children yeah. are competitive. This isn't just yeah. competition. No, this isn't just wanting to win the, you get the first one across the finish line. Absolutely not. Um, Jenny, what do you think? You're a parent of really, really young children. I mean, this idea that like, he, you know, they were in his room his hotel room and that this was going on in rooms in front of other people you know i hate yeah. to say it but i think that these parents i mean i don't know how they sleep at night because you know listen we all we all think that our circles are tight you know and that we know what's going on but you and that's why i push this so much like the whole thing not just you know in sports but it's in fashion it's in hollywood it's in music it's in school it's in it's in after school activities. You have to realize how widespread this is. And um, what I really, really wanted to say was that, you know, Nasser's um, brazen, you know, so brazen attitude with everything where he would have just, he was so reckless. He was so almost like he knew he was going to he was not going to get caught or that exactly. he was, or he, well, or that, yeah. What I was going to say is it's extremely indicative of the possibility that he was surrounded by yes men, surrounded by gatekeepers, surrounded by people mm -hmm. that he knew had his back because they're probably doing the same freaking thing. Or, or, something, or, or, you know, that's something that came up in the show. With, I brought that up in the show with Robert that like, you know, he probably knows 
you know, a, a lot of things that, that other things, other kinds of crimes, you know, uh, corruption, uh, abuse, things that were going on within the organization. Um, and yeah, you know, it, the other participants or just, you know, he was, um, you know, it's entirely possible he was also performing other services for these organizations and the ones that people know about. Okay, so the next part that was in there was how, she, that was, you know, in, in fact, in some ways, this is probably the, one of the most important data points is she talked about how eerie the Caroli Ranch was and how it was miles away from civilization, that if you, there was an accident, you would have to be uh, airlifted by helicopter, that the closest civilization was a high security prison. I think that is a super interesting data point we need to get into and how there was no cell phone service there. Um, this sounds like some other places to me. You know what I mean? This, if you, you know, go back and listen to a lot of testimonies we've taken from uh, MK Ultra survivors who've talked about, you know, having had experiences at summer camps, having had, um, you know, sort of training camp kind of experiences, you know, where it's, you know, the whole thing. Um, you know, I was always aware that, that I knew that it was remote at Curly's Ranch. I was not aware of, um, I was not aware of how far away it was from everything else and how that a, a, a high security prison was the closest thing. But I will say this, my first thought uh, when a lot of this started coming out was that, uh, oh, we should try and get some Google Earth images of the Caroli Ranch from up above because they probably will obscure them. And I, I was wanting to check and see what kind of proximity it was into any kind of military base or any kind of um, uh, just, you know, like a, like a Raytheon or Rockadyne or Northrop Grumman kind of property or something like that. Um, you know, this just makes me, have you guys ever seen any of the pictures or videos of the Curly Ranch? It's like, um, so it's almost, like, in some ways, it's kind of like Neverland Ranch, Neverlandish, but instead of being like Peter Pan or that kind of stuff, it's more about like, outdoors like, they, like hunting and fishing there there's like man-made lakes he has exotic animals like llamas and camels and stuff there um and it's uh you know they have like um the dormitories look like uh like old western town and stuff like that like it's very um almost cartoonish in some ways you know what i mean um but it makes me kind of wonder like what else could have been going on there. These, this place was really only used when there would be training camps going on. And then they also rent like summer camps for regular gymnasts there, like at certain times. But like, is there a possibility this was used for other things? It almost reminds me of like, a, like there could be like hunger games kinds of things going on there. You know what I mean? Um, what do you guys think about that? Go ahead, Randy. I actually don't have a whole lot to add to that at this point. Okay. <laughs> it's just observationally, I think we're all coming down the same place. Okay. So yeah. 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 I, I mean, that this feels, this isn't just an after school program. Yeah. Yeah. So anything for you on the, on that kind of point, Jenny? Well, I mean, I, I was, I was sent to a, lockdown facility in the mountains of Blue Ridge, Georgia, okay, mm -hmm. uh, which has since been shut down for child abuse and neglect. Oh, imagine that. Yeah. Uh, affiliated with the Worldwide Association of Specialty Schools, also known as... Oh, I, I, I remember when you were posting about this. Yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, just speaking from experience, I can tell you that these privately owned um, privately run organizations that cater to children and it's a very specialized type of catering. In my instance, it was um, troubled children, troubled children and teens. Um, and in this case, it's uh, athletically gifted children mm -hmm. and teens. Um, and so we need to really open our minds here, folks, and, uh, uh, you know, consider the possibility that this is more than just sports. This is more than a, like Randy said, it's not an after school program. What are they having these kids doing? What kind of training are they having these kids go through? Um, what's going on underground? What's going yeah. on in the vicinity? Yeah. Uh, you know, what's going on above us? You know, it, there, there's so 
Uh, there's no regulations whatsoever. It's privately owned, and that yeah. in itself needs to make people go, what is going on? I would venture to guess, and I don't know this for sure, but I would venture to guess that it's probably an unincorporated territory, meaning area that isn't part of a city or a county limit necessarily. Um, and so there was probably very little oversight in any way from any kind of sheriff or police department or anything. Not, not that they're trustworthy either, but, you know, like, let's just pretend for a minute that we live in a, in some kind of just society. Um, but no, I, that your point about what was going on underground was going to be something I was going to bring up a little further down, but um, <coughs> absolutely. And um, oh, there was something it's else. It's like to me. Um, so I spent some time up at Big Bear. Mm -hmm. a few years back and it came to learn that heavyweight boxers train up there actually all athlete a bunch of athletes kickboxers uh, mixed martial arts elevation. people yeah because the they train there because of the altitude yeah you know you're over seven thousand feet but the interesting thing about it was when i was there just the remoteness of it the darkness of it and then finding out that, well, not only there were their training camps, there was, there was a Scientology enclave there. Of course. There was um, a number of, let's say, dark arts performers who had mm -hmm. dwelled in that area. And pretty soon you start to get the connection again because uh, you've got what is probably very intense powers focused on this area because of ley lines, because of altitude because of the incantation spells and all the mojo that has been spun over this area. I wonder, I, I wonder what the, what, uh, I, I haven't looked at the kind of location as far as ley lines and stuff is, that's interesting. Um, but it, you reminded me of what I was gonna say. And what I was gonna say was, I also wonder, you know, when these girls would go there, they would train during the day and then at night they would sleep in these like, you know, kind of dormitories. But I also, you know, we have to consider that there's possibility that there was other things going on there at night. We know what ha you know has gone on for so many of us and in our community for people at night. Um, also, you know that there's these kinds of like little activities there, like things with the animals and the stuff like that. Like, what could that have been some sort of like memory overlay for? Right? Like when you're not training, oh, we went off and we did something fun. We saw the camel, but is that really what was happening, or is that kind of what you remember happening? Because you know these. Things like that, just like it, you know, they can be used as sort of um, screen memory kinds of stuff. You know what I mean? That, uh, am I making sense here? Absolutely, absolutely. And and what what that actually just brought to mind hearing you talk about is like, you know, this whole thing with the memory overlay and the smoke screens and just uh, all of that. Okay, I think about I was I was brought to this clip of Allie Raisman giving her testimony, and I thought to myself, here is such a um, phenomenally strong, physically strong, mentally tough individual. And she has, she is still so compartmentalized mm -hmm. and so controlled that she, no, none of these girls at this stage in the game through all of their trauma and everything that they've been through, they haven't thought to ask themselves or do a little bit of research about what's going on in Hollywood, what's going on, what's, no, what's really going on. Yeah. Um, and the, you, you're still going to CNN. You're still going to these outlets. You're still talking to Megyn Kelly, who publicly um, defended one of the most violent and disgusting um, individuals that was central to the Pizzagate conspiracy theory, which is not a conspiracy theory at all. Um, why haven't, why are they not talking about that? If they're so deep into this, why haven't they gone there yet? I think for, I mean, like, and I talked about this a little bit in my interview with Robert, like a lot of these girls, like, are, like they're so sheltered, like for their whole gymnastics career, all they really know is like, maybe they do schoolwork, maybe they don't, they do their gymnastics thing, they watch what they eat and they sleep. So they like, you know, it's not that they're not bright or intelligent, but they're extremely sheltered and extremely naive. Mm -hmm. And so I think that actually makes them, this is why I have so much fear about them um, or not fear, concern about the way that they're going to be. And we'll get into this a little bit more later on. I want to kind of get to this list. Let's fall over here. I want to hit on it. This is where my concern stems from. They're a very easy to manipulate group. Super victims. They're the it's, perfect it's, it's the perfect victims. victims because they don't know. They're thinking that, okay, this is finally getting some serious attention. And um, the, 
media creatures and the political creatures see in this an opportunity to make themselves look like they actually care mm -hmm. and to help um, blur some lines and to steer, to put a, a, a good face on a movement that they're trying to steer. Um, we'll come back to that. Like once we're through like some of this video clips and stuff, we'll come back to that because I want to get deeper into that. But just briefly going down the list here, uh, obviously we know that with all kinds of grooming and pedophilia and other kinds of abuse, the snacks and stuff like that are given, especially with gymnasts. Like they're at the ranch, their diets are completely controlled. And so if he had snacks, he was giving them, particularly if he had candy or something, then like that would be a way to make them believe he was their friend. Right. Um, she, uh, Maddie addressed directly um, Marta Caroli and Valerie Lucan. Marta Caroli, uh, and again, I'm going to have to say this one more time. I said it with Robert. I don't think it's a mistake that her initials are MK. They love these kinds of, uh, you know, subtle suggestions and putting things in front of your face. Um, and uh, she talked, and, and Valerie, so she talked about feeling, you know, how, how small and disposable they made her feel. Um, one of the things I find most interesting about this entire case, this entire thing, is that um, even though eventually Marta became only the like the team coordinator for you know to many decades prior to that, she and her husband were had their own athletes that they coached private you know their own privately trained athletes, um, and so far no victim no vi none of the victims that have spoken out about this were Caroli gymnasts or were gymnasts of Valerie Luke, and at Woga, his gym is Woga in Dallas. So both these gym in Texas, and, not, you know, and Valerie has now taken over March's position. Valerie is the father of Nastia Lukin, the 2008 Olympic champion. Um, I do find it fascinating that, so that to me there's two possibilities. And I do wanna say, Dominique Mochanu was a Caroli gymnast who did, who's spoken out. She's, never, she's been speaking out for years about physical and psychological abuse. She's never alleged sexual abuse. She has been very supportive of these girls. So I want to kind of set her aside from this, but we have, I did a search about a week ago. I haven't had a chance to, to look again, um, but I was looking to see if there was any comments on this from Kim Zemeskel or Betty Aquino or Mary Lou Retton or any of the other very well-known Paroli gymnasts. And there were none. And I did the same to see if there was any comments from, uh, gymnasts from Woga, uh, like Carly Patterson, 2004 Olympic champion, Nastia Lukin, 2008 Olympic champion, any of the others from Woga, and I couldn't find any. I will say that in a clip I'm going to play a little later from the UCLA meet this, this past weekend, uh, Caitlin Ohashi, who was a Woga gymnast, was involved in some of this, that, in that video, but, but no, no kind of direct statement on her own. Um, and the only thing I heard from Nastia Lukin was that basically several months ago when this first started coming out, she actually was asked about it and she laughed and then later had to come back out and apologize and say she feels for these girls. So there's two, po I see two possibilities here and I can't decide which one is grosser. Um, either all the gymnasts were being abused except for the Carolis and the Lucas gymnasts because they're the head of the program and so somehow they were protecting their own gymnasts or their, the, their gymnasts are still so deeply entrenched and so deeply under mind control that they're, they still have Stockholm syndrome. I don't see another possibility. And, um, and the most disturbing thing about all of this that I've heard is that, um, and again, I, I found an article, to, I went looking to see if Mary Lou Retton had said anything. And what I found instead was some, an article that included a post from Dominique Mochianu talking about how Mary Lou Retton had gone with Steve Penny, former president of USA Gymnastics, who had to be, had to step down, went to Diane Feinstein to try to stop her from passing a bill, saying that, so let's forget about my, my bad feelings towards Diane Feinstein or for government for a second, because Maddie Larson is right. It's, incre it, it's ridiculous that we even have to talk about that there should have been a law about this, right? This is like, it's, like, it's, like, it's completely insane, right? But, uh, so we're formalizing something that should have been obvious. But Mary Lou Retton apparently went to Diane Feinstein to convince her that gymnastics was just a fun, safe, and happy sport and that nothing was wrong and to please not pursue this bill. Um, I find that Mary Lou Retton has children. Her daughter's on the LSU gymnastics team. I find that so far beyond disturbing that I, like, I, I almost couldn't believe it. Um, if I have that wrong, 
I apologize, but that was, I, she certainly hasn't come out and said anything in support of the girls who have testified. So, it, you know, and she's, you know, a huge figure in gymnastics. Um, so that stuff, what do you think about what I said about that either they're, those gymnasts weren't, were the only ones not abused or that they're still completely having Stockholm syndrome? What do you guys think about that? I think it could be. I think it could be Stockholm syndrome. That's what. Yeah, that's what I think too. Be. That's what I was just perfect. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And you would almost think the opposite of it that they're complicit, which again is this whole victim perp cycle, or at least enablers and people who cover. I mean, somebody like Mary Lou, Lou Ratton, she's, you know, she's a, she's an icon. Yeah. And they do not allow those people out front without being vetted, sanitized, bleached, and, and completely cleaned up. And whether she has children or not, and whether she maybe has been more protective because of what she knows or because she is protected by what she knows. But, you know, it's hard to believe that you're in a major sport like this as, as an iconic figure. And you have it looked at this, formulated an opinion, and being a reasonable person, maybe want to speak out given the level of victimhood that's going on here. Yeah, I do want to commend um, Shannon Miller, um, many time Olympic and world medalist, who is an attorney and who has spoken out very aggressively about this. She was not a Caroli gymnast, but I know she trained many times at the Caroli Ranch. Um, and she is a lawyer, and she has said that she is basically going to dedicate as much of her life as she can to. Uh, helping to ensure this doesn't happen and she's spoken out very aggressively um you know so you know but it's interesting none of her none of the other teammates from the 96 olympic team have said anything no mm -hmm. carrie strug no kim's maskell no one so we have this as maddie larson called it a perfect abuse environment and then we now have a lot of the people who are in that environment uh stockholm syndrome kind of thing or you know covering for people um, she did say also, and I know this has happened right during around the time of the hearing, that they did close the Curly camp. The uh, USA Gymnastics terminated their contract with them. They were going to buy the camp, um, which is interesting to me. They terminated that, and the camp has been closed. And I did hear that um, Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, has launched an investigation into the Corollis about the sexual abuse that occurred there. Um, but in my opinion, it's probably way too late. Um, whatever evidence or information, anything was there has been gotten rid of. Uh, if there's anything going on underground, that's probably been sealed up. And, you know, they, they you know, the Corollis have not come out and said anything about this. If they were truly surprised by this or thought it was horrific, why not come out and say something? Um, but now they've had more than a year since this story first broke to um, cover it, anything that might be there. And um, yeah, so that, that's, you know, it's nice that Abbott wants to go do it, but it would have been better a year ago before they had time to clean up the mess, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then she was talking about, and you already brought this up, the whole thing with the Feinstein and, um, and, and you know, it, it, it just, the bill has now passed when she has said that the bill hadn't passed. But even in there, you can kind of see that like, oh, thank you, Diane Feinstein. Paul Ryan's a bad guy because he hasn't done it yet. Now, they ultimately did end up doing an overpassing you know, everyone, you know, there wasn't much argument against it. But again, this, we, we, this shouldn't even be a conversation we're having. You shouldn't have to pass a bill that requires you, you report sexual abuse to a law enforcement. And in my head, in some ways, like two things come up. Okay. The, in some ways, now they want to know about it. They want to know what's being reported all the time. Not so much so they can help because we see what they do to whistleblowers. But so they can sort of monitor everything and know who's saying what, where, when. So what they have to cover up and who they have to take out and who they have to silence. But also, um, the story came out just a few days ago that the FBI knew about this for more than a year before they did anything. So what is the point of reporting it to the FBI if they're not going to do anything for a year? Mm -hmm. happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. They don't do their job. They don't do their job because at the very top, um, there is a system in place that protects these people. It protects these predators. It's yeah. owned, run, that's, and operated by predators. So well, that, that's, that's my whole thing. Okay, they, they don't do anything for a year because it took them a year to basically cover the tracks that needed to be covered, get their people in the right places, remove Rewrite a script. Write yeah. a 
script. Yeah, that's pay it. people. Yeah, yeah. You know, and this go. You know, we'll get into this when we talk some about the PizzaGate thing. But um, especially, you know, lots of people sent lots of things that are in some ways uh, more substantial evidence than th there was in a lot of ways in this case, other than testimonies. And the police ignore it. You know, like you know, there was hackers that went in during the PizzaGate thing and found all sorts of weird stuff on Comet Ping Pong's server. And they told they told the police and the FBI how they could go look at it. And the police and the FBI did nothing. They, you know what I mean? They just let, yeah, and, and gave them time to clean up their server and move everything off. Um, okay, so the, um, let's see, what was this? But, and then the whole thing at Michigan State, like how for 20 years they've been receiving complaints um, and not done anything. And we all know that they run a lot of these mind control programs through universities like Stanford, like Harvard, you know, they, this is what, where they What is the status of the files that were found on Anthony Weiner's computer over, what, 15 months, 16 months ago that was leaked? I don't know. I think uh, the Judicial Watch is still trying to, to, you know, sue for information on that. And George Webb is still asking for the metadata about that, you know? <laughs> well, good for him. But you see how long it's taken them to get even close to breathing space on any of this stuff. It's all been buried, sanitized. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. what evidence there is is so tarnished by the environment in which it's emerged, which is exactly the point. You know, the media always manages somehow to taint the victims, however coyly they do that. You know, they, they tilt things in a certain way and then they put discreditors out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that there is always that gap of deniability that what you're seeing is actually real or that actually represents some aspect of our reality that we don't want to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, anyone have anything else they want to say about that stuff before I go into the next recording? Do whatever you can to give us this, some loudness. Oh, okay. I had I had it turned up as far as I could. So, um, all right. Let me see if the next one. Let's, hopefully, the next one will be a little bit louder. Okay. So this next one is a gymnast who I wasn't familiar with until I saw her testimony here. Um, her name is Cameron Moore, and um, this is interesting for a couple of reasons, but. Um, it confirms a suspicion that I had that nobody was talking about yet. So let's listen to this. This one's a little bit lengthy. Um, I like this girl, though. It, she's very interesting. Uh, if you guys have a chance to uh, try and watch the video yourself, we're just doing audio here. I'll see if you can watch the video yourself. Um, she has, I don't know. I like this girl. She's kind of a badass bitch. <laughs> All right, here we go. Cameron Moore, K-A-M-E-R-I-N-M-O-O-R-E. What would you like me to know? Thank you for being here and for driving all those many miles. Thank you. May I speak to the defendant? You may. Larry, initially I wasn't going to come here and say anything to you. Not because I didn't have anything to say, but because I didn't want this child I'm carrying to be in the same room as a child molester. Even an unborn wife shouldn't be subjected to that. That's how deeply I hate you for what you did to me. I was a gymnast at Twist Stars for 12 years, and I was notorious in my gym for always being injured. I had my first major injury when I was 10, and that marked the beginning of our very long and very close relationship. Every year it was something new, a torn hamstring, a fractured back, and then surgery after surgery after surgery. Every time I thought my gymnastics career was over, you were there to nurse me back to health. Any place, and any time. You allowed me to come to your house late at night or had me sneak in the back door at MSU for treatment. I couldn't believe how lucky I was that the great Larry Nassar was always at my disposal. You called me your guinea pig because you'd always try out your new tech techniques or treatment tools on me. And we always joked about how big my file was. By the time I graduated, I had three or four files, I think, to hold all the paperwork from all the times you had treated me all the times you had worked to gain my trust, and eventually all the times you abused that trust in order to abuse me. When my dad passed away when I was 12, you became the only adult male figure in my life that I trusted. That was also the year that I made the U.S. national team, as well as the year that you and I became much closer. You would talk trash about my coaches because you knew how much I hated them. 
You would have snacks for me at the national team training camps because you knew we were on a highly restricted diet. You even cried to me one day alone in your home as you told me one of your deepest secrets about your family. You weren't just a doctor to me, you were my buddy. But it wasn't long after our friendship developed that you decided what we now call your special treatment. I vividly remember the first time. I remember you telling me that I had to wear either my leotard or shorts for the treatment. I remember how absolutely mortified I was when you asked me if I had started my period yet because you couldn't do the treatment if I had a tampon in. And I remember becoming more and more uncomfortable and tense as your hand slowly massaged its way closer to my genitals. And you put your finger inside me, all the while talking to me as if what you were doing was perfectly normal. It wasn't. You abused the trust that I and so many others put in you for your own sexual gratification. For that alone, I can't imagine a punishment great enough for you. However, in my eyes, you did something to me which is even more unforgivable. You molested a little girl who had just lost her father. You knew my personal life all too well, and I can't help but believe you used my father's death as yet another opportunity to manipulate the trust I put in you. Was I not suffering enough? Or was my suffering making it that much more pleasurable for you? I don't want to know the answer to that. I'm mad at myself when I think about every time you put your fingers inside me and I continued to trust you. No matter how disgusted and embarrassed I was. No matter how hard I shut my eyes and no matter how many times I lied to you and told you that I felt so much better just so it would end. Even when we were alone in your treatment room at MSU and you had the audacity to ask me if you could videotape yourself doing the treatment on me. You told me that it was so you could teach other doctors how to do the same. What a great educator you are. I think the little girl that I was every day that she had the common sense to say no while you were setting up that video camera. You had never met a little girl with a voice of her own before, had you? I want to thank my mom right now for raising me to know that even as a little girl, I had the power to say no to a grown man. I doubt she ever thought I'd have to use that power against someone she considered a friend. And she did consider you a friend. She trusted you, and now she feels like she's failed me as a mother because she couldn't see what a psychopath you are. Her and I both have to live with that every day. It's hard to imagine that even after all of that, you had me so wrapped around your finger and I still trusted you so much. Even when I was a sophomore in college and you were the only person I called to help me make the decision to end my gymnastics career due to my injuries. After 18 years of gymnastics, you were the only person I called, not even my own mother. And do you remember what you told me? You said, Cammie, you've suffered more than anyone in order to do this sport, and nobody should have to suffer that much. It's time to be done. So I guess in some weird way, you did care if I suffered. You just didn't care when it pleasured you. When I found out what you had really been doing to me, I understood so many things about why I am the way I am now. Why I hate when anyone touches me unless I initiate it, even my own boyfriend at the time. Why expressing any type of emotion to anyone is an extremely calculated move for me. And if anyone ever makes me feel like I need them, I get so angry and I immediately cut them off from my life. Sometimes I feel like the only emotion I'm capable of feeling is anger. Almost every friend I've ever had has told me that they don't understand me. They don't understand why I want to live alone. I don't like being around other people when I'm vulnerable. <laughs> they don't understand why sometimes I'm the life of the party and then all of a sudden I seclude myself in a corner and shut down completely. At this point, they've learned to just leave me alone because they have no idea what to do.
I could go on for days about all the ways that what you've done changed me, but that would be a waste of time, wouldn't it? Because you don't care. <clears throat> You're too concerned about your own mental health and pretending to be some sort of victim and this enormous disaster that you created. You've heard from so many young women about how confused they are trying to process what you've done to them. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be there for my teammates while they were struggling to deal with that. But I was there for one person, and I had to watch them process their confusion. My own brother, imagine that. He's now a gymnast at the University of Michigan, and when he realized what a monster you are, I watched him frantically search the internet, trying to find some proof that the chi in his shoulder is somehow connected to his genitals. Because after he had surgery on his shoulders, you treated him in your basement. You pulled his pants slightly down to expose him in front of one of your other female victims, actually, who was in that basement as well. And you put acupuncture needles right next to his genitals. I'm not sure how my brother's shoulder is connected to his balls, but I guess chi works in weird ways. My whole family was fooled by you, but I know now who you really are. A child molester and a master manipulator, and I don't blame myself anymore for being the innocent child that I was. But I will very soon, with the help of my family and my friends and my psychologist, be free of this pain that you've caused me. You, on the other hand, will learn a whole new meaning for the word friend in prison. You have no family. And freedom to you will soon become any moment when you're not in fear or when you forget for even one second that your victims are living wonderful lives as survivors while you rot in your cage. It took too long to get to this place where you will finally have to suffer those consequences alone. Okay, I'm gonna stop that there because that was kind of the crux of it. But I kind of, something about her really resonated for me in a lot of ways, but. Um, she's yeah. pissed, she's, she's so mad. She's pissed and um, mm -hmm. you know, a couple things there, I, she's pissed and she is, um, she brought, I, I, when this, you know, if you go back and listen to the show Randy and I did over a year ago about this, I said, this is, this is happening to little boys too and to boys too and no one's saying anything about it. And so that she brought it up, um, I think, and I'm kind of disturbed that there hasn't been a little bit more made of that, you know what I mean, in this, because um, that's kind of an inconvenient part of this in a lot of ways for, you know, the way it's trying to be steered. Um, but also I like I didn't like, but I appreciated that she talked about what it's kind of done to her personality and how she behaves now as an adult because of this. Um, and she, in some ways, reminded me of a lot of other people that I know and some things about myself as well. You know what I mean? I appreciated her sort of sharing that, but there was a lot of interesting things in this testimony as well. And just to go through it, you know, she was going to his house late at night or going to the back door at MSU. What the hell is going on at Michigan State? Like the little girls are going in the back door. They weren't even like she wasn't even a college student there. What is she doing going in the back door there late at night? Um, I think Michi I think if there was some kind of project or program being run, it's being run on a certain level out of Michigan State or through Michigan State because every response that's come from anybody in the administration or the athletic department or the president there, some of them have resigned, has been so like not addressing the issue at all, you know what I mean? So in the kind of cover your ass, the uh, ass hat kind of crap. Um, but I thought it was also, but I also see back door as like um, a trigger, like a trigger thing or like, yeah. Kind of, um, yeah. Trigger like, language. Trigger language as well as- And double entendre and everything else. And I don't yeah. want to go into the salacious aspect you got of it. that. You but got it. Yeah, no, that's that, the back door. What, what does that mean? You, and she said that when she would go in the back door to Miss Hugh, she'd be told that he was, she was a, his guinea pig. Well, that's sort of what MKUltra people are. Like they're being experimented on. 
So there's the term guinea pig. Um, well, there's signatures all over the language, even in what she's talking about here. Yep. I mean, of course she's pissed, and she's fingered him very well. She's basically smeared it all over him. What strikes me is that she was grateful for the gold medal. Did I hear her say that? No. No? No. Did I hear a mention of... Sorry, I was, I'm, I'm having trouble with the audio, so I thought I heard something there. I guess my point is this. There is nothing in terms of prizes, titles, that can possibly, I'm, not, I'm actually kind of at a loss for words right now. Yeah. How, there's no compensation possible egoically, financially, or otherwise for the level of abuse that, that she's been through. Yeah. Because just like anybody that's been through an MK Ultra program, whatever has surfaced here is probably only part of what's really there anyway. Yeah, Jenny? Yeah, um, man, you know, again, that, that like the back, the la the back door in the guinea pig language. I mean, I have some more points down here. I'll get to, but to me, that was just like, whoa, okay, that's interesting. She's starting to use language that we understand as something else. Right. Absolutely. And I think that's, you know, that's you know, we can talk about how there's been systematic, uh, you know, almost ritualistic abuse mm -hmm. taking place not just in gymnastics, but we see it, we saw it at Penn State. Yep. I mean, all the Australian rugby uh, circuits, they are like Australia and New Zealand, they are like notorious for, for, for um, having um, these, these- Hazing rituals uh, kind well, of thing? No, it's, it's not the hazing rituals. It's just a known thing that um, that part, you know, those countries and their rugby teams are just very entrenched in pedophilia, systematic pedophilia. And so, you know, this is a pattern. We're seeing a pattern. Yeah. And, you know, when I think about, you know, she even mentioned, she was like, whenever you would walk in, like he would, she would get a vibe. I mean, I was yeah. very trusting. He follows the very, the, the patterns, very consistent with a predator like that. Okay. He didn't write the book on this. It's not the first or the last person to manipulate. Right. No, it's, almost, it's almost like he's following his own tra training, his own programming in some ways. I mean, just the way he systematically, robotically did the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Like, to me they all do. And, and yeah. so the point that I'm, I'm, I would like to make, which will, I think, hopefully segue us into what we're, all three of us are really talking about and what we're hopeful for, because at the end of all of this, this comes down to the exposure of MKUltra on a mass scale. Yeah, I don't think that people are really ready for that, but fuck them if they're not ready. Yeah, ready well, or not. No, and let's just go there. Hold, hold. Okay, so. Okay, go ahead. Um, just as Project Talent had a public side and a back end side, the public side being this feel good campaign that promoted. Um, exceptional children in programs and yet on the back end was actually the gateway into not just MK Ultra, but probably dozens if not a few hundred other yeah. programs for yeah. which they were basically the sorting mechanism so with this you have exceptional people exceptional young females physically and exceptionally malleable females personality-wise because of the amount of trauma that they've already gone through as a result of training. Mm -hmm. And I think both of you know that's true. I know it's true uh, from other disciplines, but I think it's exceptionally true here because you're dealing with a, you're dealing with a subculture. I can tell you as a male that men can be very predatory towards females in let's just say on display in certain ways and that gymnastics does that and that there is a subculture that feeds off of this directly into the pedophilic impulses of base males specifically so in a way what you have is a gateway program into 
not just a mind control, but also a subculture yeah. that feeds off of this and the energy feeds off of it. Yeah. I'm not saying there's anything wrong per se with gymnastics or that what occurs on the bars is in any way salacious itself. It's what it becomes as a result of the energy that's invested into this in really subtle ways. The molding, the molding of the psychology and the physiology. Yeah. Yeah, um, so real quickly, and then we can fully get into that, I just, because actually what I have to say here is going to segue right into, I think, where we want to go. Um, another trigger code word kind of thing I noticed in there, she referred to what he does is the special treatment, right? That's another one with double entendre. You're getting special treatment, or this is the special treatment. Um, you know, like that, that, that can, it's kind of a code word, a trigger kind of word. Um, but what she, she mentioned in there that she would just like say she felt better, so he would stop. I also, I was watching, there was a program on Lifetime last night where they interviewed some of these girls, and a couple of them were saying how the weird part was that none of the injuries that he ever supposedly was helping them with, even though he's a world renowned doctor, he never made them feel better. And one of the girls talked about when she switched to another gym and he stopped being her doctor, she went to for res regular physical therapy that involved doing exercises, not getting raped, you know, that her back injury that had been a problem for years and years went away in less than three months. So here's this doctor who's supposed to be the best doctor in the field, and that's why they use him, who apparently never actually healed any of them. He, you'd think that for what he was doing to torture, to do this awful stuff, he could have at least healed them along the way, but that didn't happen either. The handler. Um, but uh Bunny in the course of any of this look at the referral network that was funneling into this guy. Yeah, totally. I mean like okay. he was, yeah. So then also she talks about how he wanted to videotape this. And one of the other things, actually the thing that he got some of the original charges on was possession of child porn. So I wonder if that some of these things he was videotaping were for to share on child pornographic networks. You know what I mean? Because there's a whole, you know, systematic thing. Yeah, the whole, well, there's a whole subsector of the dark web that feeds into this. Yeah, and also and, was he, so, sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Also, was he taping it so that they could, you know, is he just one of many? Is there a program to train people on how to abuse girls? Because that's part of um, a best way to, if, if, the, if there's a mind control program going, the sexual abuse we all know is part of the compartmentalizing of the mind, the fracturing of the personality. <laughs> And then if that, you know, we see that in what she says next, where she talked about <clears throat> how she, you know, as an adult, is not okay with affection. She isolates herself and that it, sometimes she's the life of the party and sometimes you can't, like, she can't even, like, she just totally shuts down and goes away. So she's acknowledging the, compar the, the, split, the split, the fissure that's happened within her. Um, and so I thought that was interesting. And then, of course, when she references her brother's, treatment and I you know I appreciated uh, her ability to use some level of humor while she was obviously talking something that disturbed her when she talked about how she wasn't sure how her brother's shoulder was connected to his balls through chi um, but the treatment acupuncture on the genitals to me sounds like torture that sounds like a system of torture which we also know that sexual torture is part of mind control programs so those were the things that I kind of got from hers I think hers in some ways provides uh, some to me, like if there's gonna, it just she strikes me as if there's gonna be one who does the further looking and starts to figure this out, it might be her. You know what I mean? Because um, she's presenting. She it seems that like she's already sort of showing the next level that some of these other girls aren't even showing yet in their testimony. What do you guys think? I support her. I hope she. I hope she moves forward with it. I hope she keeps going. You know, for people who are listening because this is about the USA Gymnastics scandal who maybe heard my on Robert and show and they're not sure quite what we're talking about here. What we're talking about MKUltra is a mind control program that has been running through not just this country, but other countries as well. Um, really since post post uh, second world war, possibly even before, but was something that, um, you know, kind of came, <clears throat> got some uh, recognition or some notice like in the 70s, and they tried to say that it ended, but what they really did was, you know, separate it into lots of other programs, and the, the thing behind it, you know, is basically, it's a, it's a mind control program, and it's a, create, it's a, you know, basically creating sort of um, altered uh, personality types able to accomplish seemingly unhuman kinds of tasks, and there's a million and 52 different ways this can be used and done, 
Um, but that is sort of kind of, you know, where we're going with this, what we've been talking about here and how um, the mind control programs are inextricably linked to um, pedophilia, human trafficking, and uh, physical and mental abuse of children. I think, and I, I would go as far as to say that that's, you know, kind of why you asked me to be on the show because my my hot button is the um, exposure of the pedophilia syndicates um, and, you know, everything that goes along with that, you know, not just the exposure of it, but, you know, what has gone into it and how it has entrenched itself in every layer of society and this just mass campaign of desensitization and recruiting, you know, gymnastics is, is, you know, it's just one example of, of uh, just this mass recruiting campaign mm -hmm. to draw kids in, um, to, to sort of appease the parents, ply them with possibility of fame and fortune and, you know, oh, your kid's going to be great as long as you're completely compliant, hand your kids over to us. We'll give you their schedules. We'll tell them how, we'll tell you how to feed them, how to train them, how to treat them. And that's it, you know? Um, but one, one more thing I wanted to say about Nasser, and then we can like leave it alone, um, and get into other stuff is that he strikes me as, um, a kind of, um, profile or an archetype, if you will, of the, um, the chosen or the quote unquote, I'm using this term very loosely, but a lucky, um, individual that was chosen um, by his, you know, by his peers, maybe by his superiors, just by people in the club, um, because he was not a talented doctor at all. The great Dr. Nasser, was he a great doctor at all or was he a quack? You know what I mean? It, it just makes me think that he may have been um, a kind of chosen, um, some individual that was chosen to handle these girls. Uh -huh manipulate these girls, turn them out into the, into the world, into the limelight. He knew exactly how to speak to them, exactly what to do, what to say, what not to say. Um, and again, his, his brazenness is just indicative of the possibility that he was surrounded by people that were enabling him and allowing this mm -hmm. and even encouraging it, supporting it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we see this in all spectrums. I mean, I, I really wonder if his role was actually as a programmer or handler and the cover for him was that he was a doctor. Right, exactly. Doctor. And, 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 doctor. Right, and the right. fact that he, you know, was willing to, you know, and the fact that he was willing to do some of these disgusting things that are part and parcel for fracturing a personality and creating compartments in the brain and whatever, you know, is it made him the perfect, you know, you got, you have to find somebody who will enjoy the work. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, um, Jenny, why don't you, I just want you to kind of take us away here and let, let people know again, because there's some people, if they're gymnastics people listening and they might not know a lot about some of this stuff. Can you explain to people what Pizzagate is and more importantly, Pedogate, how Pizzagate is part sort of of what P, the larger problem of Pedogate is and the difference between what the mainstream media presented Pizzagate as and what it actually was. Sure, my Because it's not over. No, it's just beginning. It's just beginning. It's, you know, it's, it's been a really, really long, long, long time in the making. Pizzagate, um, as a term, is uh, a, a term that was given to um, a quote-unquote conspiracy theory that was derived from the uh, WikiLeaks, the 2016 WikiLeaks that took place in October. Um, thousands of people scanned through these documents and discovered a pattern. Okay, um, and the pattern evolved. Um, things, uh, you know, emails revealed that there were some very um, shady activities being carried out by a few central figures, namely Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama. Um, there were a few others, including James Alephantis, um, David Brock, John Podesta, Tony Podesta, um, a few others. There's many, okay, but we're talking about the central figures and how Pizzagate was born. Um, why is it called? Why is it called? Like, what what does pizza have to do with it? Can you tell everybody about that? Pizza uh, or cheese pizza, CP, is code for child porn, child pornography. 
um, and there is a very distinct, undeniable pattern of um, pizza parlors and uh, being involved in this, in in, in um, hosting events that are very pedo friendly um, and and um, entertaining um, political figures that are um, that involve themselves in pedophilia as well. Now, um, the problem with Pizzagate was that it was jumped all over. Um, everybody and their mother um, jumped all over it. They quote unquote debunked it. They sensationalized it by um, what I believe what they did was they planted uh, several actors. They staged a shooting. Um, a gunman entered the Comet Pizza, Comet Ping Pong restaurant in DC, owned by James Elephantis. Um, he entered, you know, this gunman entered the establishment and was apparently very unruly. Um, and this painted James Elephantis, who was um, factually, okay, this really happened. He was named Forbes uh, top 50 most powerful men in DC. He is a pizza shop owner. Why was he that powerful? He hosted several banquets attended by and for Hillary Clinton and the DNC um, communities in, in general. Um, so these, these circles are very tight, okay? And there is a lot of uh, language, um, very consistent throughout the WikiLeaks documents that indicated there was something going on that was not normal in any sense of the word, um, and that it was heavily, you know, there was heavy involvement with, the, with pedophilia and abuse of children, ritualistic abuse and consumption of children. Just real quickly before we go yeah. further, I just want to say the thing with the pizza, what she said is correct about CP being cheese pizza, but the FBI acknowledges that the way um, child molesters and people who are interested in pedophilia communicate online about it is by using code words related to food, yeah. particularly pizza. They will describe exactly what they want by naming certain toppings. Yes. They have other food codes for um, like chicken lover means something. I don't remember what it means. And they talk about, um, they want pasta on it. They, they, there's all this code and the different food relates to uh, what kind of, what kind of children they like or what they want to do with them. And this is acknowledged for many, many years by the FBI. In fact, they have an index of symbols that are, that are all that go with this as well. And some of these symbols happen to appear on the signs for some of these restaurants that are involved in this kind of story. Um, but so that was one thing. Um, and the other was that uh, also when initially when this first started to break before people got, before the media got control of it, you could go and look on Comet Ping Pong Pizza Shop's Instagram and stuff and you would find pictures of children taped to tables pictures of like apparently in the bathroom there there's like pictures of like like men looking at little girls and things like that like all sorts of really strange stuff that of course has been taken down since then um and and there was also in the instagram hashtags for some of the same words that are used as code in the um, chicken right lover. chicken lover things like oh, that um, take them take them to the basement and kill them like weird stuff like that like weird very strange terms i may not have that exactly right um really strange terms um, and okay, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to I, as encapsulated by Marina Abramovic and her work, the performance spirit, artist. Spirit cooking, yeah, <laughs> yeah, spirit cooking. Um, so the you know like the 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 rabbit the the sort of rabbit trail of um, actual actually, if you take the time to go through it and, and look at some of the evidence that was uncovered, and there was a lot of people who did great work, like lots of, there was, there's also a lot of nonsense out there, and you have to really be discerning to sort of poke through and, and see what actually means something. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the people who did really great work on this were like uh, Melissa Honeybee Zachariah and Titus Frost. They both made some interesting sort of documentaries about it. Um, Titus Frost also had some interviews with the hacker named um, Big Fish, who hacked Comet Ping Pong's server and found stuff on the backside um, that he tried to inform the DC police of, but they they said they were aware of it, but they didn't seem interested in investigating it. And he said it was very disturbing. Um, what I, I, I'm you know I'm, I'm missing some stuff. It was a while back now, but um, can you also explain to people sort of what? Um, Oh, the, well, the other thing why it was so important, you know, a lot of people like to say that the 
debunked accusation was that Hillary Clinton was running a sex ring out of the basement of the pizza parlor. And that wasn't really it. It was that these uh, strange emails came from people who were, were part of Hillary Clinton's campaign, part of her staff and whatever, and implicate her tangentially in some stuff. But we also learned from uh, lots of other research and information how closely the um, Clinton Foundation was related to child trafficking that happened when they with uh, the situation in Haiti and how the Clinton found didn't the Clintons help to get Laura Silsby who had been arrested for trying to traffic 33 33 of course children out of Haiti she they helped her kind of get off of those charges and then now she's um, works for Amber Alert which is in charge of uh, helping find missing children. So this is kind of what we're talking about with this. Um, the people who are doing it are the one in charge of the system. I, do I have that right, Jenny? That's exactly right. I mean, that's right. Exactly. And can you tell people exactly what the sort of phenomenon, like, uh, like the, the mechanism, what pedogate or what political pedophilia is? Can you tell people what it is and how it works? Well, for, I mean, listen, it, this is my understanding of it is that what we are in the middle of right now is breaking through a kind of mass Stockholm syndrome, a mass brainwashing um, right now where this information, while to uh, somebody with common sense and an open mind, those are the two simple ingredients uh, in this, it's not that hard or shocking to, to grasp this, okay? But for the mass consciousness, for the collective consciousness of this country in particular, it is so um, beyond anything that people are, are generally prepared to deal with that we are facing, as an alternative media community, we're facing a really huge challenge battling all of this disinformation, all of this counterintelligence, if you'll even call it that, that's coming forward to you know, quote unquote, debunk these, these, um, these statements, these ideas, um, you know, anybody that looks at the evidence, you'd be, you're a complete moron if you don't see something wrong with this. I've been saying this from the beginning, you don't see something wrong, or if red flags are not raised, if your entire body does not react to reading some of this information, then your instincts are weak, you make a horrible parent, you're a horrible person. <laughs> I really believe that. You, you, you've got to be a complete just... Or, or you're completely brainwashed and under my control and you need help. And, the, and you need yeah. help, yeah, and I guess, and you know, I'm, I'm not the right person to, to help you because we're past that. you you got to make a choice, okay? Now is the time to make a choice. Um, Pedogate differs from Pizzagate because Pedogate encompasses all of it. While Pizzagate, we're specifically talking about Comet Ping Pong in Washington, D.C., and that particular um, group, that particular instance. Um, and so we've kind of, you know, those people are still implicated. It's still, a, you know, a pinprick. It's still a small um, allergic reaction on, on a big animal, okay? Pedogate is the big animal. And we're seeing all of this coming out now. What's really interesting, and I really wanted to bring this up, also is that I think what's next is the fashion industry. And the reason why I say that is because very, very recently, um, I've been hearing a lot about Gianni Versace. I live in South Florida, okay? Miami is not too far from where I live. And everybody remembers Gianni Versace's murder, okay? He was murdered. It's made of the major motion picture coming out on this, by the way, TV series. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And Andrew and Cunanan murdered that, yeah, that really weird story. It was a, such a strange story. Yeah. All the little spidey senses, my spidey senses started going off. And then it occurred to me, um, you know, some discussions that I know I, I've heard you guys have and some things that occurred to me myself was that the people that are responsible for putting together, writing these um, scripts, writing these shows, these movies, okay? Netflix is one of the biggest sources of program. It's free now. You get it with your package. Like they're like, here, take this, take this pill, right? So <laughs> it, it, it occurred to me that they are trying so desperately to get ahead of the narrative that they have, perhaps they're starting to, or are continuing to, and with more of a capacity to do so, um, detect what's going to come next. Okay. They're trying to get ahead of what we are going to 
start discussing, start revealing. And Gianni, Gianni Versace being so iconic and that story being so um, important to the fashion community and, and also to just the culture in South Florida and just pop culture in general, they're starting to, to discuss it. They're starting to, to make these movies and talk about it more because I think what's next is the exposure of pedophilia in the fashion industry, which it doesn't take a genius to see that it's just obvious, okay? Yeah. And, and There's not a, lot, not a lot of difference between the upbringing that goes into child models right. and child athletes. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially when you get down to body image and dieting and perfect body types and whether- John Benet Ramsey. Exactly, well, John Benet Ramsey is the poster child yeah. for what we're talking about. It is taking a child and molding them in, in the image of an adult before they have the emotional stable, stabilizers to deal with these things. And not only that, but breaking down their natural defense barriers. Mm -hmm. Which goes, let me ask you something. Okay, so these, these gymnasts, and based on your backgrounds and based on the fact that you're both females and you've, you've kind of been inside of these worlds. In the course of the type of trauma that we're talking about, and we, you know, some of this is going to be opinion. There is symptom. There's symptomatic outworkings that come as a result of abuse. There's there's um, the manic side of it, which is is how you emote, you express, you push out the uber emotionalism, the withdrawal, the depression, the cycles. Is it because these particular activities are so physically involved that either A, the, the parents, the people who are supposed to be protecting them can't see this because it's being masked? Or is it because it's being ignored for the greater good and it's considered to be part of the rigor that goes into uh, building the talent? I honestly, I think... So a huge part of it, Randy, is that people are targeted. Families are targeted. They choose people. I love um, it when I offer two two questions and I get a, a and B, and you give me C. That's perfect. That's no, that's great because uh, that's what I wanted. Thanks. Uh, sure. I mean, but, but that that's really what jumps out to me is you know yeah the, the, you know between getting your kid into child modeling. I mean. My parents tried that, you know, and, and luckily for me, you know, well, I don't know how lucky for me, really, I should count my blessings, but I don't have the body type to be a model. I'm pretty short, very muscular. I would have made a horrible model, okay? And also the clothes were too expensive. My mom was bitching about it. She's like, ah, I have to buy all the clothes. But in any case, um, you know, gymnastics and, and the sports, I mean, all the money and the <coughs> scheduling, these, these people are distracted and they're also extremely determined to do what they think is right for their kid, for their kid's future. And don't, don't, let's not, you know. But that really is part of the emotional component as well. Absolutely. Is that when you're targeted, you there, are, there are incentives that are given. Absolutely like, there are. Does it, whether it's Project Talent, MK Ultra. Yeah. Whatever you're lured right. into or trapped into, there's incentives. So I'll share something here since, okay. So um, I'd say it's A, B, and C. Randy, you're right on both accounts. And Jenny, you're right on your account. Okay. So it's, it's all three of those things. Um, okay. But here's like something interesting that I found out for myself. Um, and I don't like, for me, like uh, the, I think the um, MK Ultra thing for me um, uh, was probably determined before birth and started before the gymnastics thing happened. But I think the gymnastics thing, if it wasn't pre-planned, played nicely into it. Um, it you know, it, 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 was it was great. We can get her all trained in sort of military fashion when she thinks it's, they think it's because it's what she wants to do. We don't have to trip, you know what I mean? We don't have to get her to do something she doesn't want to do. Um, but one thing that I found out later, and if you, you know, that um, a portion of my gymnastics training was paid for by my mother's company. My mother worked for da -da -da, Atlantic Richfield, all right? Tarko, who we talked about when we had Alana Freeland on, is involved with some of these uh, patents related to certain kinds of energies and energy fields that we know are used in some of these programs and different stuff as, a, as in addition to obviously oil and whatever. They paid for a portion of my gymnastics training, but they would only pay if I went to a specific kind of gym. And so the gym that I went to, fell into that. So, 
you know, that's, I mean, that's part of the sort of um, targeting and nurturing, you know, they, um, you know, I, thought, I didn't know that until, you know, like my dad told, when we were talking about something a few months ago, he told me that. And I thought that was really, really very interesting. Um, you know, if I had gone to a privately owned club, they would not have paid. But since I went to a, a, a gym that was, quote unquote, a, um, a nonprofit organization, right, which means that it's receiving funding from all sorts of other things, right, then they were willing to pay for that. So what other kinds of things were being run through that gym? What other kinds of funding were being run through that gym? Um, I think that in some ways is part of the targeting. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, it's, um, I think a lot of times with parents, it's, you're right, they're distracted. It's, you know, a lot, a, lot, a lot of these families don't have a lot of money. They're working overtime, extra jobs to pay for it. And then there's other families that are just so, um, and sometimes it's done because they love their kid and they want their kid to be happy and it's what their kid wants. But other times it's the parent's own desire. They're blinded by wanting their child to be different, special, better, more, all that kind of stuff. Same like in modeling or acting or any of those kinds of things. And it just gets away from it. Just, you know, like it's kind of once your family, especially, you know, once you get past a certain point, like once the kid is into their early teenage years, at this point, the, not just the parents and the child is doing the gymnastics, but the whole family has had their life shaped around this. There's been so much put into this that then even if the child starts to express some resistance, there's pressure from the family like, we've put so much into this. You have to see this through. And, you know, the child, and you, when you listen to some of these testimonies, they talk about, you know, they, they were scared of their coaches. They felt like they had to do this. They... Um, you know, it was to, to them, it was like, there wasn't, it wasn't like, it, it we, we didn't know that there was another life. Now I wasn't in, in anywhere near the kind of situation. That so basically we're had. talking about the preservation of an asset. Yeah. This is an investment. It's an investment. It's Whether no different than, and let me be shockingly crude here just to make the point. It's a lot like owning an expensive horse or something that performs. Mm -hmm. In other words, this is all performance-based, meritocracy, you earn your keep. Well, that's one of the subtle message of it all. And the flip side to this is you have the same thing with boys and sports. Totally. With the exact same things going on in the background, by the way, and State University, Jerry Sandusky, and that whole tunnel that that, about, that for me is like baseball. What about baseball? baseball? The kids who like swim with their family, the kids in Cuba who swim with their father swims with the kid across so the kid can have a chance to be in Major League Baseball in the United States and stuff like that. Oh, they, they, this is these are things that families sacrifice everything for. Yeah. There's there's pride element. There's the hopes for hitting the money. There's the overall promotion of a system because a lot of this is Masonic. It's ritual as Jenny pointed out earlier, mm -hmm. it's deeply embedded even going up the food chain into the bloodlines and genetic targeting and all of those aspects. Well, sometimes for anybody who's listening, and I know that you guys have like a really awesome group um, that, that have been tuning in. Um, you know, we're not dealing with rookies here. Um, which is refreshing for me. No, but there may be, the reason I had you go over some of the basics is because there may be some people sure. who just found it because of the gymnastics. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt. No, not at all. Um, sometimes I think there's, um, people are, are, are dehydrated for, for some kind of um, clarity about the bridge that connects MK Ultra and current events. And why does MK Ultra matter so much? Why, why, do we, why do we talk about this? Why do we continue to bring this up into conversation? I know, really? <laughs> yeah, you know, well, just... And you know what is because it's, it's part of why, it's just part of why we're here. And, I, and because it, it is important, there is a bridge. There's a very, um, there's a very s solid bridge that, that connects MK Ultra and the political, the political spectrum, the, the entertainment spectrum, all of it, they're, they're all connected. And the thing that I would like to say about it is that, you know, and I can only really speak from experience, from research, and then there's opinion mixed in there, but basically my hardest thing that I fall back on is my experience. And my father being 
um, an agent for the State Department most of his life. I mean, he was groomed for it um, and worked. I, you know, he lived and worked in D.C. I lived in D.C., went to school in D.C. I was recruited for these enrichment programs mm -hmm. um, in Fairfax County in Falls Church, Virginia. Falls Church, by the way, is the hometown of the Podesta brothers. Um, you know, so I think with, with MK Ultra, the bridge that, that some people um, would like to see just to have it make sense is that these children are assets. They become assets. Assets for what? Political gain, political agenda, okay? Which group gains stewardship mm -hmm. over these children? That is, those are the balls that juggle. And that's when we look, when we're looking at elections, when we're looking at who's in power this decade and who's in power that. How decade. Hollywood influences that. How all, how, yes. It, how, and how also, I, I think with athletics, sorry to interrupt, with athletics, the like Olympics is like a micro, like a symbolic version of like world domination, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you look at the way, um, it's like, offering to the gods. Are you kidding me? Offering like, to the gods, but loose it's also thing again. Yeah, loose <laughs> harvesting, but it's also. I mean, look at the way that like the United States dominated the last Olympics. They won by like ten points. The in the gymnasts, right? It's embarrassing almost. And then far, far behind that is Russia and China, kind of just like in the regular political sphere that we're dealing with, right? So it's like it's like um um stylized, stylized war, right? It's like a stylized war where where their domination can be shown. Absolutely. And then, you know, if you if we look at the, the origins of the Olympics, this really is about taking the cream of the crop, the best of the best genetically gifted mm -hmm. specimens of this realm and offering their talents as an appeasement to the gods. Okay, yeah. so tell me, if, why do you think MKUltra uses so many of the names of the gods and the goddesses? And, and we play into that yep. so deeply. This is another form of inversion. Okay, this is just another form of manipulation. And the bridge that, that connects MK Ultra and the political sphere is that um, it's that it is about agenda. They want to control the best of the best, the brightest, most magnetic, most t talented, most skilled amongst us, uh, so that they will be able to use them as instruments for whatever agenda, uh, whomever is in power that decade or that year. Okay, and so that's why we keep talking about MK Ultra as experiencers. Um, as 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 you know researchers and, and people who actually give a shit it is our responsibility to talk about what we know about and and watch how it plays out watch how it affects the, the consciousness um because there is no stopping this information from coming out um it's just going to continue to happen but you know i think that you know when we talk about warfare and we talk about mm -hmm. you know the whole the the you know good versus evil light versus dark I mean, we're in the middle of it right now. It's why all three of us felt like shit, you know? I, my headache is gone, by the way. And I think that has a lot to do with just being brave and-, and, and Working through just it. Just pushing yeah. through, actually, just uh, working through the pain. Yeah. 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 All, of, all three of the us- The energy felt, lifted as we began to kind yeah. of- the, You Mr. could Rendell, feel it. All three of us felt tremendous um, uh, yeah. interference and resistance you know, before doing this all day and I, I, you know, trouble sleeping last night and headaches and stuff. So let's, I want to take this because you're doing a really good job at sort of drawing this bridge here. I want to explain a little bit more. Let's talk about the problem with the Me Too movement and oh. why we have such concern about <laughs> The, this in, in relationship to what's going on with the gymnastics sex abuse scandal. And then when we get through that, I'm going to wrap things up with a little bit of good news because I love gymnastics and I have to leave people on a, some, on a positive note because there is some good things going on. But let's, you know, um, the Me Too movement, as soon as, as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh God, it's like another thing. Like, okay, it's, I just want to be very clear here because I talked about this on Robert's show a little bit and I didn't explain my position. I'm not victim shaming people who are part of the, you know, especially people who are not celebrities who have come out as part of the Me Too, Too movement. Um, I actually have tremendous respect and empathy for you and I don't want to see your tragedy and your bravery used as part of a movement that is not what you think it is, that has been created, that has been promoted and is there to um, deceive people into thinking that the media and the political sphere actually cares about this to make it's also there to create 
divisiveness between men and women. And when you have a story like this that plays so really well into it, it's there to put a face on this. Um, from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jenny, the hashtag Me Too was started by Alyssa Milano. And Alyssa Milano. Well, person for uh, a very popular, very well known uh, child, uh, I believe it's UNICEF. Mm -hmm. Okay, so listen, I don't know all that much about UNICEF. I have not done the research, but I know Aly Alyssa Milano to be a gatekeeper of sorts. Okay, she well, is. Mm -hmm. cool. Remember, didn't she also have, like, and if I'm wrong, correct me, but back when all the like Syria stuff was started, like, stuff was starting with Syria, she made some kind of strange sort of sex tape where she was like in bed with her boyfriend or husband and was like talking about the war in Syria and or, or how the children in Syria and how they had to be helped and saved. It was like a really weird thing. Do, do you recall this? Like, I don't. I miss yeah. that. Yeah. It, like it was it, like I, I, I like I, I swear to God, like I, I mean I could be wrong but like it, it also like uh, if you remember the whole thing with the Coney 2012 and Angelina Jolie like they do this where they have like celebrities start pushing like a social movement or a hashtag kind of thing um, or you know it, or even so they sometimes will take something that was organic I don't think this one was organic to begin with you take something that, like it, if we look at, if you know, what helps me to kind of put everything into perspective is if we look at the internet as an organism, a living, mm -hmm. breathing, thinking <clears throat> organism, and then we look at these hashtags as being viruses mm -hmm. or antibodies, depending on what they are. For example, hashtag pedogate is so censored, you have a hard time finding anything of substance or quality relating to the hashtag pedogate um, uh, term on, on any, on social media at all, because they've scoured through it and censored it. But when you have something like hashtag me too, this is promoted. This is counterintelligence at work. This is a counter campaign, a virus released into the organism of internet um, in order to control the, na the narrative. And, yeah, and it's an echo chamber because a lot of people begin to echo it who don't really aren't they part have no of that. They what they're talking about. No, it's a hive network at that point. And also my first thought when it first came out was, they, part of the reason to do this was they knew that, like, A, you can't keep the lid on this pedophilia thing forever. Right. Also, you can't keep the lid on, like, the amount of, like, ridiculous kind of uh, harassment and shit that goes on in Hollywood. And by doing this Me Too thing and getting people to identify themselves and tell their story, they can get out, they can identify who they have to worry about, who they have to watch, who, where they have to go to cover up information. I mean, I heard, you know, like, where, like, it's kind of like if you, anytime you hashtag something, you're, it's like putting a tag that can be tracked on yourself. Now they know that you are, you know, like, I mean, think about how many people who had a secret before and now it's not a secret. Now everybody knows. And if there's something that needs to be covered up in relation to that case, now they know who's going to, who, who, you know, who's saying they have a story. Total profiling. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, and I also so you see like, the, you see the tremendous power that's wielded by universities like UCLA, Penn State. And I can tell you that long before the scandals emerge, there has already been a level of disruption and there has already been containment. So that whatever seeps out of this, however bad it appears and however damning it is, is still just a, a controlled leak. Contingency mm -hmm. plans. And, and that's play. what we're getting is controlled leaks right now because mm -hmm. there's, there's still the filter there of the media. So like with Penn State, because I, I live here and I knew about this a long time before it ever happened, we knew that there was a network. We knew that there was child trafficking that was actively done as a conduit between the state capital and where Penn State is in a place called Happy Valley, that this was an active <laughs> network. So long before that there was up there was fallout so all of this controlled leakage is allowed to come out which i guess brings me to maybe my hot button which again is this activist judiciary movement against the convicted doctor and the fact that this is a scapegoat maneuver to basically 
make it all go away now. We've, 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 we've hung we've, the bad man. Yeah. We've bloodlusted enough that we've, we've vetted this, we've vented it, and now we can move on because the bigger, and I'll keep saying this because people need to probe harder. There is a hierarchical structure to this. There are networks. There are networks within networks. And there is a structure that never gets touched in any of this. Mm -hmm. The very people who fund it, feast off of it, and live off the blood of innocent, innocent people. That's what it comes down to. And please, before I forget, there was something I, that, as you were talking, I, I wanted to bring it up. And the hashtag Me Too thing. Now this, and especially in recent years, um, months rather, this, um, this warlike energy that is being extracted from women in particular, mm -hmm. okay? Um, the, 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 whatever you want to call it, the sacred feminine, the divine feminine, whatever you choose, there is a very specific energy, uh, signature that is derived from women that are, uh, that feel, um, this rising, okay. This, this rising energy inside. Okay. It's, it's almost palpable. You can, you can measure it. Okay. Um, well, and they want to direct it. They want to direct exactly. it. Right? At yeah. a time in history where it is so so important that this energy, especially this feminine energy, there's nothing wrong with masculine energy at, at all, but this is a time for, for feminine energy to kind of come back into the picture and do what it is supposed to do, which has nothing to do with hashtag me too. It needs to be wielded um, appropriately and not as a weapon towards other people. Absolutely. And yeah. what's happening now is I see, I mean, the, mil the, the women's march, are you effing oh kidding me? Millions of women that all, all of these women are perfectly good conduits of, of, of energy if they allow themselves to be of divine energy, of pure energy, ancestral, maternal energy. If this energy was directed towards the real monsters, towards mm -hmm. the real issue, they would stand absolutely no chance. The, they would, the, the feminine energy that of, of this planet that is, has laid dormant, has been suppressed, there really is something to the patriarchy, okay, and how bad they've been, and yada, yada, yada. It's not about, you know, toxic masculinity or anything like that, but this is more just about misdirecting this feminine energy yeah. that they know is coming. It's, it's they know for thousands of years that this time is now, we, and it should be channeled to protect the children. Right. Point blank, but done. Instead, instead, they're doing, they're, they're trying to tear men down, especially even a lot of men that have never done anything wrong to a woman in a life are being accused of being toxically men or white males or whatever. Yeah. Randy's and bad because he's a white man. Yeah. And, and he's, he's a heterosexual. He likes women. You know, he likes vagina and he's a man and he's white. You're part of the problem, Randy. F you for, for existing. How <laughs> dare you? You know well, what I mean? It's just like how. It's like, so wrong. Just like how the Black Lives Matter movement, like sure, there is a, a level of a real problem there, but instead of, of the movement, instead of that energy being used or that anger being directed towards the system that is creating the, the, right, this, instead it's just um, uh, white people are bad or, you know, or just Republicans are bad. Well, or, this is a social engineering component of it, oh, largely yeah. because of the goldfish effect. Most people only live 10 to 15 minutes in a time frame, yeah. so sound bites and video images and 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 flashes are how people they're formulating subconscious opinions that eventually express, and they're merging into the pool of the collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. At as you said, the very time when all of this is attempting to come up because we're in this consciousness wave. Well, even even think they had in the women's march they were wearing like the fucking pussy hats. So like the, the like the vagina facing up. So this energy that should yeah. be like it like yeah. it's like misdirecting the energy like you know. So the interdimensional monsters that live right outside of our visible spectrum are right there eating. Well, and in fact, what you're talking life. about is a magnification, and and it's actually a distortion it's of a complete inversion. truth yeah. about the womb and how it is the creative yeah. source, right. and that we mm -hmm. honor the female as being the place where creation occurs mm -hmm. in the womb. Yeah. Whether you ever have children or not, that potential exists and it is, it's, it's highly spiritual. Right. And it is profaned by everything that we've talked about in ways 
that are less obvious. If a woman wants to celebrate a vagina, there are ways to do that that are tasteful and useful, just as with men and their appropriate members as well. <laughs> I'm not a prude. In fact, I actually the other night was watching a movie and went, look at that, there's a penis in that picture. You just don't see that very yeah, often. It's all and it's kind of like, what? Like, do we get to... <laughs> you know, yeah, so I have been concerned that I, like, you know, there's been things that have made me concerned and other things that have given me hope. I, some people, like, I, the mainstream media, like, so I was watching the special on Lifetime, I said last night, and a few other things. The mainstream media is constantly trying to attach the Me Too thing to this gymnastic scandal. And a lot of, a lot of the gymnasts, um, you know, are sort of falling for it. Yeah. Um, there's been other things, like, I was very um, glad to see that, you know, so this weekend, and it, it, I went to um, the UCLA gymnastics meet. It was UCLA against Oklahoma. And they're, they're tremendous rivals, but they have a lot of respect for each other. And both of these teams have had girls on the team that were part of this. Maggie Nichols, who was athlete A in the original com uh, complaint, is an active competitive gymnast on the University of Oklahoma team. And UCLA has four, three past team members who've come out, Jamie Dancher, Jeanette Antolin, um, uh, Maddie Larson, and their current volunteer assistant coach, who was Olympian Jordan Weeder Weaver, were part of this. So there was a whole thing. The meet was great. It was a tremendous celebration of what gymnastics can and should be. Um, the two coaches of these teams, KJ Kindler and uh, uh, Valerie Condos, are amazing. I just want to say something quickly about Valerie Condos. Um, I met her when I was a youngster. I've been going to gymnastics UCLA meet since I was a kid, and she's been involved there as long as I've been going. And um, as I, when I was about 12 years old, she became my dance teacher at – at my, the gym I was going to for a year. She was already an assistant coach at UCLA. And I used to love, um, she would come and she'd share stories with the girls from UCLA. And she was a very interesting person. And <laughs> the one I've always looked up to, she's very inspirational. Um, she was a dancer. She wasn't a gymnast. And it's kind of an unusual story how she became a, gy a gymnastics coach. But she inspired my dancing style. Like I never, you know, I, I love to dance. And um, I always think about her when I do. And her choreography is amazing. And I've watched the UCLA gymnastics team for a number of years. And I think she is um, a person with tremendous integrity who's done a really good job um, helping some gymnasts who've come from difficult pasts to become good people. Um, and she's actually been blogging and will attach it to this at her website and writing essays about some of this scandal. And she's speaking out for someone who comes from a more normal real world perspective than we do. Like, I don't think she's aware of a lot of these things we're talking about. Um, and she, you know, I don't know how she'd feel hearing me say this, but I respect her nonetheless. I think she's been speaking out as aggressively and assertively as, um, as, as, she, as she can. And I, and I appreciate and respect that. And, um, I, you know, I don't know as much about KJ Kindler, but she seems to do this similar kind of thing with her girls there. And um, the meet was awesome. And then at the end, they had a really cool tribute to all of these girls who are part of their teams that have spoken out. And it was something they did together as opposed to being opposing teams. They kind of made this thing together and these girls were all there and um, they did not, they have their own thing that they did together. We rise. They did not reference me too. And I was very glad about that. I was afraid that they were going to say something like that, but I was super glad that they didn't. And it was actually a very powerful moving moment. You can find videos, some videos of it on YouTube. Um, but I do, because of the way that these girls and their coaches and some of these college teams have responded, I have some hope and, um, I feel like whatever happens next with USA Gymnastics, I hope maybe they take a little bit more, you know, inspiration from what's going on with some of these um, college teams like UCLA and how you can, you know, do amazing gymnastics, but also it can be fun. I understand when kids are little, they have to, you know, learn skills and have learn focus and discipline that you already have by the time you go to college. But, you know, this, this, this can be fun and still be amazing. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be this militarized. I, the, I am also worried. I didn't like how they keep calling the survivors, the sister survivors, an army of women. Like, I don't like the militarization. I, I understand the sentiment, but I worry about what you're talking about, Jenny, that sort of military you know, weaponization of the female energy that way. Um, you know, so these are things I worry about, but I also see some signs that there's some th hopeful things happening. You know, all the entire board of gymnastics has stepped down. There's, you know, another coach somewhere in Missouri today was arrested 
on charges. I think this has been like a this deluge, a deluge that's going to continue to come. Um, but I think we have to, um, you know, we can't let this. I mean, I, we can't let this be part of the Me Too movement. We can't let this no, be. No, absolutely not. Correct. And that's. That, that's the people who can the, the people. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. The people in the mainstream media who are pushing, the, uh, trying to push and make this part of the Me Too movement are like your Megyn Kellys. They're the same people that laughed at, the, at people who were talking about Pizzagate, helped try and cover it up, who um, you know make excuses and cover for corrupt politicians who are involved in this kind of crap. I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, no, I mean, it's so important now that people. I shouldn't even say people. It's about people that are seeking, okay? Because if you're not seeking this information, you're going to avoid it. It doesn't matter if it comes up and bites you in the ass. You're going to find 10 different ways to avoid facing it because all, essentially this is, the, you know, the pedophilia and MK Ultra and all of this, this isn't just about secrets that the government's been hiding. This is the nature of, of this realm. This is, mm -hmm. these are the most fundamental secrets, the most fundamental orders and and rules and the, it's literally we're trying to expose their playbook okay mm -hmm. and That's it. So, we are freeing humanity in a way that we we have not had this opportunity in hundreds of thousands of if, years. if 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 every if every one of these girls and their families who've been through this now comes to have an understanding of what you and I are talking about, whether they completely agree with our perspective on it or not is irrelevant, whether they come to have an understanding, of, if they come to have an understanding of what we're talking about, that, that is enough people that this won't be able to happen anymore right. on a certain level. You know, if, if, if all these girls and their families start questioning it, it, it kind of bleeds out, you know, it, it, like the only thing that's gonna fix this is awareness. Mm -hmm. Right. This isn't something we're going to be able to like arrest our way out of, or fight our way out of, or or there's too many, there's oh, too many. Millions, millions of these people. Sorry, I stepped on you there for a second. Oh, it's okay. Go oh, on. I've been stepping on everybody. No, I'm. Paused. I think a lot of it goes to the core fundamental values of what we're extolling in our culture, which is, again, the striving. There's nothing wrong with striving for excellence in anything. There's nothing wrong with the attainment of beauty and grace and all the things that go into anything from music to art, to gymnastics, to tennis. Um, what has happened is this has all been so deified now that it has attained the culture of people who will give anything to have it. And parents who basically are ambitious at the expense of the safety of their children. And, you know, I, I, I can't, as I said earlier, I, I can't help but think that were it not for the smoke screen that's put up by the um, level of activity invested into this, signs of trauma would be more obvious and the red flags on the field would probably yeah. have been seen a lot longer. And they rely on that. They rely on all of this to continue masking this system because it is, well, we said it, it it's a system of energy harvesting on a soul level. I think some of these things that you're, we're calling smoke screens are also like, okay, so things that are the sign, uh, actually the sign of the problem are somehow seen as a strength. Like a kid who's able to- Of course, com yes. Completely dissociate and like, fo like focus and go into almost trance was the, as they compete. Obviously that's seen as like a, um, a, a gift to, or a skill that helps them to compete well, right? But that's also the sign of a person. You know, it's also a sign of a person who has been dis who's dissociative, who's been fractured. Who, you know, and there, I'm not saying that it isn't possible to do tremendous visualization and be very, very focused without being abused. But the the two, like when it's because of abuse, it looks not that different than when it's not because of abuse. And so it requires tremendous discernment on the part of the parents and the adults around to really understand what's going on with their kid, with the kid, and also tremendous um you know skill um and care and compassion on the part of the coaches it is entirely possible like it is entirely possible to teach focus and discipline without te without involving uh, mind control and mind control and abuse and yeah, fear abuse and all of the yeah yeah and it's it, it's important to be able to inspire kids to work hard by through appropriate rewards and through 
certain kinds of life lessons. All of the best coaches I ever had, I had some coaches I really disliked. I had a lot in the middle and I had a few that were amazing. And the ones that were amazing were, they had this ability that, that like there was something about them that made me really want to work hard for them you know, without them being abusive or anything like that. I just liked them. They found a way to connect with me. I think it's important that like coaches not treat not do this thing where they treat the gymnasts like robots and treat them all the same, maybe having their favorites, but where they find, they get to know each one as an individual and find a way to connect with each one of them individually and figure out what works for that kid. It's, you know, the best performances. I mean, that was what, that's what I mean when I was talking about Valerie Condos. I watched the way she inspires and brings really great performances out of her girls who really like her. You know, and you don't have to scare somebody into doing something because they're afraid of what will happen if you don't, you can inspire somebody to want to do something and the, you know, outcome is much more beneficial for sure, you know? Well, I mean, with some of the other, um, you know, MK Ultra operations and programs they have running is that if you don't break your subject, if you don't mm -hmm. control them through fear and manipulation, they are ultimately, and it, from the get-go, more powerful, more talented, more mm -hmm. people than you are. So you had better compartmentalize them. You had better mm -hmm. get them under control because in the event that they um, beat you, in the event that they endure or go rogue even worse, you're in a lot of fucking trouble, <laughs> okay? And I, I really think that what we're dealing with now um, with, you know, just in, in general, and I want to talk, you know, and, and I mean like certain people um, speaking out that are such a threat, are such a threat, are probably, in my opinion, in my opinion, um, survivors and people that were resistant in some ways. And, you know, not to say that they're not affected, we're all affected, but, you know, I consider myself having gone rogue. And yes, yeah. exactly, exactly yeah. You know, yeah. and I know that you do. And sometimes we have weird feelings about owning it. I mean, I'm speaking for myself, but it's weird to sort of say it out loud because it's so weird and it's just, it's so, uh, you know, far out there, but it is what it is. And if, you know, had they, I bet someone out there or at some point had the thought, damn, we did not scare her enough. We didn't do yeah a good enough job fracturing her mind because here, you know, do you know what I mean? Like totally. they're doing exactly what they were not supposed to be doing. So you could better use the fear tactic. You could better yeah. them, rape them, abuse them. Because if you don't, you are dealing with a very able being that is going to eventually bring this back to you. And you won't be prepared for it. No, I think that's a great point. And I think that is, you just said really eloquently in some ways what I've been trying to say like throughout the whole program tonight is that um, to all of these girls, is, my message to the sister survivors is go totally rogue. You've yeah. already gone a little bit rogue. Yeah. Allie Raceman, go rogue. Cameron, go rogue, sister. Cameron, Cam, I think Cameron Moore is going to go rogue anyway. I don't know if she needs our pushing, but Cameron Moore, go rogue. You guys like completely, you guys have already knocked down Three, two or three of the walls, knock down the fourth wall, blow the ceiling off the place, and then let the bottom drop out, and you know, <laughs> and see how powerful you are. You know, it's very interesting. Like they either, when so when someone starts to go a little rogue, they, like little, you know, it's like you're afraid. They're, the handlers, the programmers, the people in control are afraid of that. You know, so they that's part of why they do the torture. But sometimes they also make a mistake, and they go too far. And they push someone to the point where they have nothing. And this is in some ways, you know, a little bit of a case for me in some ways. Like I had nothing left to lose. Like I was either going to go rogue and start pull my shit. And to, what's funny is to go rogue, you have to pull your shit together. I had to pull my shit together so I could go rogue because otherwise I was just going to die in my bed no. knowing, all, knowing all of the things that I know now that we were talking about tonight, but without having talked about them or shared any of them or whatever. And so I had, it was, you know, I, you know, I had reached my final straw and some people, you know, like I just, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to go that way. You know what I mean? So go rogue ladies. Um, you know, you've already in some ways done like some of the hardest part, you know what I mean? Like you've already like 
kind of admitted the embarrassing part. It's not embarrassing, but the part that like is difficult to, it feels embarrassing when it's happening or whatever. Now like go all the way and see, you know, what lies, you know, what's behind the curtain, right? Like that's, the, that, that's kind of where we're at right now. We're at the, we've already peeked behind. Let's just like pull the whole thing aside and like expose the, the hand who's operating the puppets. Cause I, you know, in some ways, Larry Nasser is actually just a puppet. Absolutely. And yeah. the most important aspect of all of this, that it, as you know, my like end statement here, the most important thing that I would ask people to, to realize here is that whatever you want to call it, a veil, a, a, a cloak, a shield of secrecy has been lifted. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind. I feel it in my bones. Something has changed. Something has shifted, and the monsters are running out of places to hide. Mm -hmm. okay? Their defenses are down, and that's why we are seeing such a frantic, frantic and desperate attempt um, to, to misdirect um, a lot of the energies that are bubbling to the surface of the collective right now. They only have manipulation. They cannot create. They're not creators. We are. They are manipulators. They are liars. That's all that they can do. And so it is so important for people to realize that the shield that existed before, this veil of secrecy that existed before, is now thinner than it has been, in my opinion, hundreds of thousands of years. I'm, I really mean that. We've never been this unified. We've never been what is known in, in mainstream academia as a stage five civilization where we are all connected via one web, which is the World Wide Web. And so we have an opportunity right now to truly pull the masks off of the architects, off of the beings that have essentially raped and tortured the collective consciousness, not just individual people, but the collective. And so that's why I, I really want people to understand that this, the, the iron is hot and it's time to strike now. That's all I'm going to say about it. Wow. I think Very that's good. maybe yeah. a great place to leave it. Yeah, so there you, you go. Yeah, thank you guys for doing this to me. This was not my most eloquent uh, discussion. I don't think it was for any of us, but I, <laughs> I honestly think the fact that we're doing this only as audio and the fact that we obviously have are all dealing with emotional aspects related to this. So there, I listening to those recordings was really hard. I had not heard them before. And um, I think we just have to leave ourselves open to be vulnerable to these things. It's, it's a good thing because it means we're not numb. It means we're not impotent. And it means that we are getting ready to stand up. And uh, Emily, anything closing you want to say? I just, you know, um, I want to thank, I want, I want to thank you, Randy, for you've been going through this with me for the last, well, since you met me really, but this whole thing with the gymnastics has been going on for, like a year and a half and this is difficult um, stuff. It's been really hard for me, you know, obviously it brings up some personal things, but also just because I love gymnastics so much. I really do. And I, I know what it can and what it should be. And this has been heartbreaking to watch. It's, it's been heartbreaking and gross and tragic. And um, I want to thank you for supporting me through this. And um, Jenny, I want to thank you for, uh, you've been also been supportive through this and you're a good friend and, um, uh, you know, I, um, I'm glad you were still at super thing. You were the super most eloquent on the show tonight. So I want <laughs> to, yeah, you you were. but also, um, you know, I think thank you for having courage to speak on things you do and guys, Jenny has a story of her own. And at some point we'll, uh, we'll get to that here on this show. That's all. I appreciate both of you guys doing this with me. Thank you for the listeners for listening. I know a lot of you, you know, gymnastics that hasn't meant anything to your life, but, um, this isn't looking at this. This is like a, just like they're trying to use the politicians in the media are trying to use this as like a test run for how they can get away with shit when their curtain comes up on their mom pizza gate and all that kind of stuff. We can make that not happen. We can use this as a way to we can not let this get swept under the rug as a practice run for not letting the, uh, you know, the larger issue that this is all over the world, you know, how, how we want to deal with this on a, you know, on the more totally massive scale. And um, so thank you for listening. And thank you guys it. for just... it was very, this is a very interesting experience. I really hope to join you guys again on your awesome platform. I have so much respect and admiration for you two in particular for this particular platform. It's my favorite um, platform by far. 
Um, it's just, it's everything that the world needs right now. So thank you so much for bearing with me through this entire process because I'm also a huge pain in the ass and I know it. <laughs> That's okay. We, we love you and we enjoy what you do. And um, you're welcome oh. back here anytime. Uh, I guess the best in the end we can do is to become creators, become victors, and understand that the energies are rising right now. And we can ride the winds. Let's do that in the year ahead. This is the year of reckoning, and a lot of stuff is going to come up. It's going to get wild. This is Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins with Emily Moyer and our very special guest, Jenny, who's been with us for two hours to talk about some difficult stuff. Night. Love you all. See you guys soon. Thanks to all the patrons out there, too. See you on the other side.